Hi again, Louis. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, being with us today for our uh, discussion in conjunction with the museum's exhibition, Turner Phrase, Language and Translation in Global Contemporary Art. Um, it's always great to see Lewis, and I'm really happy that we'll have this chance to have the discussion, which is really a follow up from a previous um, conversation we've had during the summer. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with you and chatting a little bit about your practice and um, our shared interests language and translations and everything else. Um, I do want to mention that um, our program today will be recorded. So for those of you tuning at home, you'll be able to view the recording. And if you would like to participate in our Q&A, we will have time towards the end uh, for the audience to propose questions to Lewis. And please don't hesitate to use the Q&A function in the Zoom um, webinar. Um, and the exhibition, Turn of Phrase, and its related programming was made possible by the Stevens L. Frost Endowment Fund and the Sylvia E. Fa Sylvia e. Ross Fund for the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. So uh, to kick off our conversation today, um, I was mentioning to Lewis that in lieu of doing a formal introduction, I thought I'd quickly zoom through uh, a couple slides of Lewis's work as an artist, as a curator, a scholar, an educator, and among many other titles. Um, well, I won't have the time to necessarily go through each work in too much detail and nuance, and this is by no means a comprehensive summary of Lewis's career, which spans over five decades. Um, I thought it would provide some useful context for discussing your work in the show. Um, and that said, perhaps you would interject or interrupt me if I've in inadvertently um, missed anything important. So with that, I'm gonna try to share my screen. <coughs> Let's see. Okay. Let's see if this works. Is this working? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, to start us off, I have um, images of two prints, Louis, that you made when you arrived in New York in 1964 and you founded what's called the New York Graphics uh, Workshop. Um, and I think this is an interesting point to start kind of the introduction of your career because you trained kind of classically um, as an artist um, in Uruguay in architecture and sculpture. So this is an interesting point of connection between your quote unquote classical fine arts training and then your kind of entry into more conceptual um, forms of art making. So here we have two prints um, that you made during that period. I wonder if there's anything you want to quickly say while I have these two pieces up? Well, I would say espejismo is a Spanish word for mirage. So in case people see it and don't know what the work means. And is folded out so that one becomes half of the word becomes a reflection of the other, although it's not. Uh, now, well, I, I evolved from classical sculpture to expressionist printmaking, and eventually got very bored. <laughs> I don't know, exposing myself and decided yeah. that. Uh, intellectual exercises were more interesting than my personality. And uh, I resented at some point the limits between visual art and that excluded language. Mm -hmm. And I never understood why, why it has to be a visual image as such and language is out and you learn literature and mm -hmm. language skills somewhere else. Absolutely. So uh, in 1966, I had a crisis with my expressionist work and decided to explore what would happen if I, instead of making an image, I describe it. Mm -hmm. And that would have yeah. some, the advantage of working in the mind of the viewer instead of the material presence. And that eventually became part of conceptual art of sorts which didn't exist at the time as a term or as a concept. Uh, but I always consider my, myself as a visual artist, even when I used language. Mm -hmm. I was not interested in literature or even less so in poetry, which yeah. sometimes I'm accused of. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, yeah. then I decided that 
I didn't want to be a printmaker trying to make art. I want to be an artist occasionally using printmaking when I need it. And that was a big shift. Yeah. That's where I am now. And all the titles you gave me, I feel are relevant. I'm basically an artist and use art to know. Mm -hmm. And then it falls into categories and disciplines that are considered as not belonging to art. But my standards in whatever I do are still coming from art. Absolutely. So if I curate, I'm basically doing an artwork mm -hmm. and judging it from art point of view and not from traditional curator. Or if I write an article, my standards are again that of art and not of whatever I'm writing. So I tend to prefer if I'm introduced as an artist, period. Period. And not many hats. Yeah. Sorry. Well, you, you, and that was going to be one of my questions. So you anticipated my asking of it. But I think that actually lends ourselves um, really well to transitioning about this work when you were talking about your relationship to literature and poetry and theory and scholarship, because there's so much one can say about this piece. You know, there's the, reference to, I think, you know, your inspirations found in Borges, in Magritte, um, there's the sort of your use of tautology and self-reflexivity in language, but there's also just the sort of really interesting conceptual situation that you've set up uh, with the viewer with this kind of dialogue um, of, of an exchange between um, this, this mirroring between the viewer's physical sort of presence, but also the kind of conceptual dialogue. So this is, this, people have said that this is your early, one of your earliest conceptual works. Would you agree with that? The first one I, I yeah. did <laughs> in 66 yeah. uh, was a breakthrough for me. It was also a breakthrough in the sense that I was interested in moving the viewer and working in the space of the viewer. Mm -hmm. And so there was a series of works dealing with that was manipulating the space and the viewer's imagination yep. rather than expressing myself. Speaking of manipulating space, I think this is another example of that, but through the use of photography in this instance, I'm thinking about our perception of space, both the, the physical space in, in our sort of three-dimensional world, but also in the presentation of optical space and optical illusion. and photography being something that's both very rational, but also created using illusionism. Um, so I really love this, this photograph as another example of what you're doing conceptually. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and then I also personally just really adore these object boxes, which you started making in the 1970s, sort of towards the second half of the 1970s, where again, you're pairing up um, objects with, with text um, and creating these sort of indeterminates, um, indeterminacy, these spaces of interpretations and narratives that at once seem very open-ended, but also very perplexing. Um, and again, I like uh, kind of the references to art history or the sort of what you would say, traditional crafts of art making, right? The form and the content or the uh, the instrument and the work. But again, the the object itself is so removed from um, what the, the work is trying to do in this case. Yeah, in general, this was uh, actually kind of a dictionary. Dictionaries always were very intriguing for me, like a compendium of knowledge. I don't know, how can you put knowledge into one book? And these were like uh, references for an image word dictionary, yeah. which would also allow people to add meanings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was an open-ended project. I, I never declared it close. And there were like 60 or 80 boxes ultimately with different uh, images and their possible meanings. It's fascinating. Um, and the other kind of side of your use of image and text and language is I think your strong social engagement um, as an artist um, in the political 
systems and in deconstructing, you know, the legacies of colonialism and capitalism and violence. And here I have two examples from your um, iconic series of prints, the Uruguayan torture series, where again, you're pairing up sort of mundane everyday images with text um, that some will describe as poetic, although you might not like that description, but there is sort of poetic language in I think the sort of quiet evocation of violence without physically depicting violence on the page. Yeah, but in certain ways for me, it was more using sort of trivial images. I mean, the two you picked were the less trivial ones and trivial <laughs> statements and see if I could create the tension in the space in between. Mm -hmm. So ultimately I wasn't successful in the sense that the extreme would be really stupid images and stupid statements and see if put together something dramatic would happen. Only here I was bound by the need to deal something with torture in my country. And uh, it's in English because it was addressing the US public that uh, didn't even know where Uruguay is. Yeah. So uh, it was like trying to make some awareness about this. So I couldn't afford to go into the extreme I just described. I always was interested actually in something I called dumb art. <laughs> the, the, the work instead of telling you something would force you to tell the work and create in that process. So the really dumb work would just barely give you the awareness that it was art. Wow. But no, no other information beyond that. So that would yeah. be the ideal. I think it's so interesting that you mentioned that this was for an American audience and I'll have to come back about that when we talk about your piece being our show. But one of the questions that I've always grappled with is this issue of legibility. That sometimes when I look at you know an exhibition or a, a work of art, I wonder to whom the piece is, is more legible. Is this work too legible sometimes for an American audience or a Eurocentric audience versus say a Chinese one in my context or? A Latin American one in your context. Do you do you ever worry about this sort of issue of legibility when it comes to the public's oh, perception of your work? Very much. I I really don't believe in art as a universal language, which I think is a market-driven concept, together with globalization. So it preceded it. I think uh, there are infinite publics, and as a responsible artist, you have to know whom you're talking to. In my case, I'm still talking to the Uruguayan intellectual of the late 50s and early 60s, mm. which is probably dead by now. And I am one of the few survivors. But uh, it's still that public that I think would understand what I do 100%. And then from there, it goes down in percentage. So I would say that in the US, since I didn't assimilate, at least not fully, I'm understood maybe 90 or 80% because I use conventions that are common, mm. but I don't use tacit understandings the same way. If I would try to assimilate, I would try to share those tacit understandings and work within, within them. But I still use my tacit understandings under which I was educated. And that creates a distance. And that distance increases the further away the culture is. So mm. if it would be showing in China, it probably would be 60% instead of 80 or 90. Because Uruguay was colonized lately by the US and not by China. So the distance becomes greater. Mm. And that's something you have to be aware of because suddenly what comes in is something I call uh, an archeological gaze 
that is the amount of projection you put into what you look increases with the cultural distance. So when we look at the Mayan pottery, we, we don't know exactly what's going on in it. We like it for formal conventions that we like and project onto it. And then we try to make up a story with research, but we never get the full picture. And that brings me maybe even to Michelangelo, who I admire as a virtuoso craftsman, but whose problems about knowledge are remote from me and not interesting to me. So he doesn't do much for me except this admiration of craft. Mm -hmm. So the, there is a kind of archeological gaze on that, that I project my interest onto Michelangelo up to a certain point and cannot go beyond that. I mean, that's all, all also a form of language that has been lost in the sense that even though I could go back and read Michelangelo, I could read his contemporary, that the, the tacit understandings that they would have had are right. no longer kind of in, I don't know, um, in lost. use. Oh. Yeah, yeah, are not accessible, yeah. I mean, I really, yeah, I, I find that interesting. Even if they may be accessible as data, they're not fully accessible as empathy. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, which <laughs> sort of lends itself really well to this work. I swear we didn't rehearse this already. <laughs> um, but, but this is a really fascinating piece called Insults. And this is actually how I think I first came across Lewis's work. Um, and, and what we're seeing now is a series of sentences spelled out in languages actually represented by the UN, I believe. Um, and it says, you know, those who cannot read X language are stupid. Um, and what you and I have talked about a little bit, Lewis, is the fact that the insults themselves are inaccessible if you don't speak the given language. So, so the, the, the humor of it, or rather the kind of tongue-in-cheek element is you would not even know that you were being insulted, quote unquote. Um, and how did you first come across or, or come into this idea of using insults? Uh, well, I, I always was fascinated with insults because they're mainly expressionist <laughs> art, in which you are venting and exhibiting yourself and hoping something happens to the other and the other maybe pick up on it or not. But ultimately you are defining yourself with the insult. Mm -hmm. So what happens if an insult self-destructs by not being understood. And that was the point. Yeah. And I thought first of having a graffiti artist do it on walls in the city. <laughs> and then I never did it and did it this way. Yeah. It, it's really, it's quite fascinating. Um, and then again, thinking about your work in the larger sphere of interacting with the public, of course, you're very dedicated to issues of pedagogy and education, which is perhaps best represented by this body of work um, that is ongoing. I should add that the image on the right is the ICA, ICA at the Virginia Commonwealth um, University, and this exhibition is currently ongoing. Um, so what I find really fascinating with the museum as a school is number one, that you consider this not just as a work of art, but as a contract. So the institution that displays this enters into a contractual ag agreement to, to serve the public um, in the way that you know, you're outlining here to communicate and to help the public make connections. Yeah, my dream is actually that the public would hold the institution to account and if it perceives that the institution is not acting the way it advertises on the facade, it should be sued in class action and force the institution to take responsibility. Now that hasn't happened yet and I'm still hopeful that it might someday. But uh, it, it really deals with was the fact that, I mean, a museum is a complex institution, but it's really many institutions in one. 
So it has a function of preserving, of taking care of objects and of circulating them and of making sure that the canon is transmitted, that whatever the museum decides is good, that goodness is accepted by the public and sophisticates their taste. Now that is really a consumerist attitude. That is the museum tries to sophisticate the public and expands the consumer base, but it's not liberating the public in order to become creators on their own. Mm. And for me, art is really not an issue of production as it's normally seen, but it's a way of knowing. And it's a survival tool. And it's a way of organizing the universe. I mean, you're face chaos and have to make some order of it. And we slowly have reduced our sense of order to objectivity and rationality and are leaving out everything else. And by now, this is becoming very dangerous. From enlightenment on, when this process started in an organized way, it made sense, but it also was coupled with the development of nation states, of uh, like organizing the world in the categorized geography that took over knowledge as well. So you organize disciplines like you organize countries. And in mm. fact, uh, the encyclopedia was a little bit organized like that. And it, it was helpful. I'm not denying it, it helped technology, but it also broke the ecological balance. So you now have that our extract, extractive technology basically allowed the virus to happen. Yeah. It doesn't matter where it happened or how it happened, mm -hmm. but it happened out of a technological crisis mm -hmm. that upset the balance. And then you have a fantastically quick answer with the vaccine. And it made a lot of companies incredibly rich and self-congratulatory because they fixed the problems they created. Mm -hmm. But we forget where the problem started. We only deal with the solution. Mm. Now that educationally is being padded by STEM. And the STEM education I find extremely dangerous and dehumanizing. And the only way we can fight that and immunize ourselves is by rescuing art, not as a way of making more objects, which actually damages the ecological balance, but by using it as a way of knowing, as a way of including not just the rational part, but also what happens in between data, what happens in between objects, what is the glue that makes the universe. It's not just the points that we organize rationally, it's okay. much more, and we are losing that perception. Mm. And I think that's what we have to deal with. So it's not just changing museums, it's changing the whole educational system. Absolutely. Have students from early on understand that impossibility is a platform from which you evaluate the possible. Mm -hmm that uselessness, which is associated with art, is a platform from which you evaluate what's useful. And in that critical distance, you understand why some things are impossible and who is making them impossible and whose interests are being served by that impossibility. And that is the true political awareness that we mm. all should have. It's not about Republicans versus Democrats or DeSantis versus common sense or things like that. I mean, those are like little anecdotes. Mm -hmm. It's really seeing the world as it is in a critical mm -hmm. way and seeing where the power is and understanding why some few have power and wow. some 
many don't have it. And yeah. how do you correct that? And you correct it with a good knowledge system. Mm -hmm. And that's what education should be about, and not about training for technology. Yeah. So on this topic of training, I want to, I do have a couple slides about your work as a curator, but I just want to quickly acknowledge that when I was um, curating my show that your uh, work on the Global Conceptualisms exhibition in 1999 with Jen Farver and Rachel Weiss at the Queen's Museum of Art was very influential because it really opened up, you know, the sort of thinking about language and art beyond the Western hegemony model of a very Euro-American centric um, art history. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, your work as a curator and a scholar has also been very influential. And along those lines, you know, you've also been publishing books uh, <laughs> and um, we could talk about these um, a little bit more, but on the topic of education, I did want to circle back about um, the work that's in our show, which is, um, this is a poetic statement, part of the assignment series. And I have here images from um, the left, which is from your uh, retrospective in 2018 at the Rania Sophia, and our image from the right, which is um, the version that we acquired for the Bowdoin Museum. So it's interesting for me to also think about, you know, the, the larger lifespan of a work like this and what it means in the context of Madrid versus the context of Brunswick, Maine. So with that, um, I'm actually going to stop sharing for a moment and then come back to um, Let's see, how do I exit this? Oops, I'm gonna come back to our um, sort of webinar space as I do have a couple questions for Lewis. Um, and then hopefully if there's time at the end, I'd also share with you some of the responses that we've received so far on your assignment. Um, and they're very interesting. Um, but I want to start with um, talking about this relationship between craft and art and cognition and education. Because right before we started, um, you were sharing with us the story of, of the plumber coming by your studio. Um, and I'm laughing because during our previous conversation, I also got to visit uh, with a plumber who interrupted our interview halfway through the call. So would you mind just sharing that anecdote again about what happened most recently with the plumber? Oh, he, he was inspecting radiators and uh, at one point we went to my studio and the studio is, yeah, there is an old etching press, but it's mostly papers lying around and a big mess and no hinting about painting. I mean, I never, I painted once in, as a job, <laughs> but in any case, uh, the guy looked around very puzzled and suddenly said, oh, are, are you a painter? <laughs> and I didn't have a clue from where he got that. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that for him, art and painting are synonyms. And that reveals how a craft took over a category of knowledge. And for me, art is a way of setting up problems and trying to solve them, identify them, redo them, and so on. And uh, so I, I wondered if uh, I was a philosopher and somebody asked me, what do you do? And I say, I'm a philosopher. And they say, oh, you are, you type. <laughs> Okay, and uh, nobody would do that. But if somebody asks me what I do and I say I'm an artist, it happens all the time. So, oh, you're a painter. And that's sort of the meaning, but it's in line with the history of art, which is ultimately a history of crafts in which we all accept that the crafts are not enough, that you have to go beyond that into a thing I called craft, crafts plus. Mm -hmm. That plus is what determines if we call it art or not, but nobody knows how to define it and nobody knows how to handle it. And therefore art schools teach you how to paint, paint one, paint two, paint three, but don't touch this hot iron because they don't know what to do with it. So that is an important issue we should face. and. 
So for me, art is what I call a root activity. And if knowledge is a tree, then the main part of art is in the root because it's a way of knowing. And then in the trunk is art as language in quotation marks in which you codify what you discover in the root and try to communicate. And then in the branch, art becomes the production part that makes some fruits that when they fall on the floor, then museums come and pick them up and show them. <laughs> but it's the least important part. The really important part is in the root because from the root, you can contaminate, in quotes, all the other branches as well. It's just that the branches don't let you do it. Yeah, so it's so interesting to me um, in, in terms of your relationship to art objects. I think I was um, looking at your show at the um, Alexander Gray Gallery earlier, a couple of weeks ago in New York. And I think you have a, a sort of distancing yourself increasingly from, from objects. But at the same time, I still think your pieces are really beautiful. So do you get upset when curators, audience members comment on sort of the aesthetic appreciation for your work of art, as opposed to, you know, the sort of intellectual puzzle um, that is also so part and parcel to the work itself? I, I would get upset if they take something because it's pretty, yeah. But because that would be a total misunderstanding. I try not to use taste in what I do or to use aesthetic criteria in that sense. I, for me, it's more creating rules that self-activate and make whatever. And then if it's pleasant, fine. If it's not pleasant, equally fine. So I was surprised that uh, I mean, the dictionary you saw in the yeah. gallery, basically what I was interested in was to mix two systems of order that were presumably incompatible and had their own dynamics. So one is provided by the dictionary in terms of words and meanings. The other one is provided by geography in which Google Maps would provide a placement for the word. And then I mix them. That is for each word I saw in the dictionary, I went to Google Map to find, is there a location for it or not? Mm -hmm. And if there is a location, I would do a screenshot and insert it as an illustration of the word and move all the words forward. And that was my function. It's basically like knitting. It's a thoughtless, automatic thing I do when I'm bored of whatever else I'm doing. And when I'm bored with that, I go back to the other thing. So I'm not bored ever. But I was surprised myself that at the end, each page was attractive. It was attractive because of the red button of Google, and the random placement and some were blue and some were green as a background and, and so on. And some were funny and some were not, but it, I had nothing to do with that. It was a self-evolving thing that over the 670 pages made a nice pattern and filled the gallery. So I was very happy. I mean, in that case, it, the element of chance, I think, it sort of removed you from the craft, um, if you will. And I find that interesting because I think you previously talked about your arrangement of the pieces in the assignment series as being kind of random, right? The books that um, are in our piece are controlled randomly. They're controlled randomness. And even your use of language, it's somewhat randomized. Um, so the, there is this tension between control and chance. So do you ever factor in the element of chance when setting up these sort of automatic processes and intellectual problems? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's controlled chaos. <laughs> controlled but chaos. It's, controlled. it's interesting, I, I uh, a short time ago, I read a book by a neurobiologist, uh, Anil Setz, he's called a British guy, who speaks that 
it says that basically our perception of the universe is uh, controlled hallucination and that our biology is a system to control that chaos of input. Yeah. And that's all it is. And in reading that, I thought about that art may be actually our way of trying to control that control. <laughs> that is the control he speaks about is biological. Mm. Art in trying to control that control is our human addition. That doesn't take away the chaos. Okay, it's just a two layer control of that chaos without undoing it. Wow. And there is where art I find much more interesting than science. I mean, science obviously is more useful, but science <laughs> looks for definitive answers. It is or it's not. And science now is at quandary with quantum theory and superposition because although that doesn't fit anymore the precise yes or no system which mm -hmm. we're used to. But in art, we're used to that. I mean, that's what mystery is. Mystery is not a religious thing. Mystery is somehow the glue between things that establishes limits between what we know and what we don't know and what we never can know. Mm. That part for me is an interesting one. The one I know is boring. What I don't know is a fascinating thing. For me, it's a way where I travel into ignorance, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And we're yeah. dismissing that because of our scientific education. Mm. Now, art for me is a non-obscurantist way the secular way of dealing with mystery. And so I wouldn't dismiss mystery. I just would want to find a way, or let's say art is a way of not delegating power to mm. a god or to a priest to administer what we don't know. Mm. I administer what I don't know by doing art. That's very profound. And I think, again, that really speaks to your interest in this uh, question of pedagogy, again, as, as, a, as an openness and a gesture towards embracing the unknown um, as opposed to seeking pre-established truths. Um, and with that, I would love to share with you um, in the next couple of minutes, some of the answers we did receive from the prompt, because I think you might find them kind of humorous. And while I walk Lewis through um, some of these feedback and responses. Maybe if audiences have questions, you can feel free to use the next um, 10, 20 minutes to formulate um, your questions for Lewis. But with that, I'm going to go back to my screen sharing. Um, and then I just want to quickly point out what we have you here on this slide, that this, this difference between the, the Spanish and the English is very intriguing to me because in our interview uh, that's reproduced in the catalog here, you did say that English in English is written on the lines and Spanish is written in between the lines. So I even wonder um, how setting up the prompt as Spanish or English could potentially influence the, the outcome um, or the kind of range of responses that one would anticipate. Um, I don't know if that has any sort of credence to, to, the, the, um, to my, my conjecture, but. That's an observation that I made. Well, it, I must confess that when I did the Spanish version more recently, I didn't check the English original. <laughs> so it's like I recreated the text from zero. Oh, wow. So it's not a translation and I, I cannot not read it from here anyway. So I have no idea what the blacks say exactly. So I would have to rewrite it again from zero if I have yeah. to talk about it. But, you were translating it in, in your mind through, through your memory. In your well, I was reacting to the idea and yeah. finding an appropriate text. Yeah. It's also the, the one in the Reina Sophia was in the context of over 20 assignments mm -hmm. while yeah. the one in English was in the context of 10 or 12, I don't remember. I think it was 12, but 
that it, it's just interesting context. And of course, here we have an installation image of the working art museum and the context is very different. Um, and uh, I have just some really fun images to, to sort of zoom through. Um, I loved here, somebody drew the books thinking about, again, the, the relationship to pedagogy and our education and nonverbal, non-textual forms of replies um, in the form of graffiti or drawing. Um, and I do really like this response. I don't know if you can see Lewis, but it says, by taping the books together, systemic oppression through the use of hiding slash destroying language and storytelling is represented. The collection of open books is to represent that even when language and storytelling is being suffocated, the vulnerability and importance of, of, an, of an open book will always still continue on. Yeah. So it's talking about oppression and, wow. um, and knowledge persisting. Um, mm -hmm. This one I love. Uh, somebody wrote these books. It seems sad. They need some love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then somebody else wrote, a poem is as messy or tidy as it need to be. Loose or tight structure you decide. So there's, again, that sort of openness that I find really fascinating. Um, here somebody wrote, um, the mingling of literature into an incomprehensible mush due to a focus on quantity over quality. And then somebody here writes, disagree, communication of all form is human. So you can also see the people disagreeing with each other. Um, and then what I also love, which I feel like you would appreciate, Lewis, is that a lot of the comments are really not responding to the prompt. A lot of the comments are responding to the fact that people are writing on a museum wall. So for instance, here we have somebody who wrote, I've always wanted to write on a museum wall. Now I want to touch the exhibit. And then somebody said, me too, me three. And then somebody else asked, does this now, this wall now count as art? Um, so it's a really interesting question. It does. <clears throat> I actually, I'm always fascinated by vandalism, <laughs> which <clears throat> On one end, it's always condemned because it damages private property or public property, which is private on a different level. But in fact, if you look at it in terms of dialogue, it's an incomplete dialogue. And it's incomplete because of a repressive situation. So that gives it a different spin. And mm. sure, there's still negative uh, communication as in any communication, but it is an act that should be dealt with in terms of communication and not in terms of material damage and handled accordingly. So in certain ways you can say that cleaning a vandalized writing is a way of censorship, or you can say, it happens because there is a censorship that doesn't allow you to do it, which is the reaction of this one person, mm -hmm. which I think is great. And these pieces of assignments, my dream is that the whole room, I mean, not in case of your show, but in the <laughs> case of the room in which there are only assignments, that my part would slowly disappear, covered by what you would call the vandalism of the public that would take over the expression within that room and make me irrelevant. And okay, then, I, I, I think vandalism these days in museums carries such heavy connotations because now we're in the age of people flinging tomato soup at Van Gogh's. So does that change at all your attitude towards vandalism? Is there a difference between creative intellectual pedagogical vandalism versus you know the other uh, end of the spectrum I think there are two levels which are separate i do not condone the destruction of particularly the museum which the property is really not even one person but it's institutional on the other hand the vandalism that has happened in in the cases you mentioned was from a material point of view minor i mean the ketchup was washed away, and the yeah. Van Gogh was fine. Uh, there are precedents. I, there was a guy specializing 
in eating food with dyes that match Mordrian's paintings, he would go to different museums and vomit onto a Mondrian in yellow or in red or in blue. I don't know if he finished his project, but, <laughs> and I don't know how protected the Mondrians were at the time, okay? But uh, you have the Guernica that was written yeah. over by a guy that at the time was an artist and later became a prominent gallerist. I mean, a blue chip gallerist. And this guy, uh, well, Shafrasi was his name, I think. He, he thought that nobody was listening to the Gretnika, uh, which he was correct. And that by doing that, he gave a voice to the painting. Yeah. Now, it was a very clever way of doing it, but it certainly got his publicity at the time. Yes. So there you're back to the dialogue. Mm -hmm. How much power is distributed between the communicators? Yes. And that gives you a different uh, take on it. And I think uh, I'm against doing away with monuments that are offensive, for instance. And I think that's cleaning up history and not dealing with the issue. And I rather would create a situation of monuments that are debatable. I think most are, actually. I cannot think of many monuments that are not offensive, but I'm extreme on that. And I'm also against public art anyway. But uh, I think monuments should have an area in which people can express their opinion, expose the crimes of the person being honored. Most of them are criminals on one way or another. And it should stay, it should stay as a document of the crimes they did, mm -hmm. rather than take it away. But the crimes should be part of the information. And the definition of crime will change mm -hmm. over time. So the vandalist statements yeah. will change as well. So, so it's really it's it's really when vandalism is generative and when it inspires or then it sort of closes up um the, the dialogue. That's the sort of vandalism that we should apply aspire to in your view. Now, with the Van Gogh and similars, the problem is that the vandalism was not about what was being shown, but what was being shown was used to make a different statement. Mm. Then the communication is muddled. Yeah. So I would object more than throwing ketchup on Van Gogh. I would object the use of Van Gogh to make an ecological ecological statement and I would rather make vandalism on something that is really a symbol for for the crime let's say yeah. if not it's like taking hostage an innocent person to make the case about something else yeah that doesn't function but it's a better way of analyzing things if you do it from the communication angle than from the property angle. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Um, I want to just keep kind of zooming through these images. Um, this is an interesting one. This at the bottom that says it's too forced and awkward to be a poem. This situation is like a loveless marriage and it's weak people or it, it's weak. Um, people just want to. Uh, people just want an excuse to write on the wall. How do you feel about that? That this is like a loveless marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually quite a couple different comparisons to, to romantic relationships, which I found really. This marriage is really between the viewer and the museum, not not with a piece. <clears throat> I would think. Yeah. 
it, it could yeah it, i think it's it's up to interpretation in this instance um Oh, and then this slide I love is you're seeing um, all ranges of responses, but you're also seeing responses that are multilingual, um, which I think really speaks to the richness of the work in the context of the show. We have some Chinese, we have some French, and we have, I think this is either Tibetan or Nepali. I unfortunately can't read it. Um, yeah. We have, you have more scribbling and doodling. Um, and then I, I, I love this, this arrow, um, whoever drew this line. Um, and I think it's, again, it's, it's speaking to the kind of openness and the fluidity of, of um, the interactive installation. So I thought these were pretty fun. Um, and now we have about um, a little less than 10 minutes. I thought I'd come back um, to our, our webinar. I see that um, there are some questions in our Q&A. So um, if anybody would like to propose a question to Lewis, please take advantage of this opportunity. But I'll start with this one question. Um, from Casey, thank you, Casey, for the question. And Casey asks, um, Lewis, you spoke so articulately about how you have attempted to critique museum practices and processes in your work as an artist. What responsibility do you think artists in particular have in challenging institutions such as museums or disciplines like art history in the interests of disrupting ideas about the canon and value and taste? Are your strategies for doing so different when you create art artworks versus curate exhibitions? Look, in some ways, it's a losing battle for many reasons. Uh, most of anti-art products ended up on the wall of museums. So the process of co-optation is enormous. And on the other hand, that's a challenge because it means, okay, my work died on the wall of a museum. So I have to find a new way of attacking the museum and knowing that 10 minutes later, it will die again. And it's a process that helps generate creation. Then you have that uh, the museum, while you attack it, it gives you credibility. So that I can attack more museums than somebody that is in fewer collections my credibility is bigger. And based on that, early on in the late 60s, I started, I decided that I would be collecting museums rather than having museums collect me. So I started a strategy of getting it into as many museums I could. Any institution that had the name museum in the title was fine. I didn't care about quality. And I, I cared about quantity. So by now I have 45 or so. And that gives me a capital of credibility that is quite big. It's like having a huge amount of credit cards, which implies that you have a lot of credit. And the difficult credit card is the first one when you don't have credit yet and the banks don't trust you. But after you have many, then it's like a self-evolving process and you don't have to worry about it. But the danger of that is that on one hand that you start believing in that, that you are better because you have more museums, I don't. And the other thing is that if you deviate too much in your attack, then you leave the field defined as art and therefore you become totally innocent. So you have to be attacking the art system. You have to work within the art system. Mm -hmm. And therefore you have your hands tied. And yeah. that makes it a very difficult fight or it makes it a losing fight. So the only thing you end up doing, and I think it's working, is that you somewhat educate the curators. And I'm seeing the difference. I mean, not just with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing the difference. If I compare with the curators that were active in the 60s, with the crop of curators that are active now, they are much more understanding, much more enlightened, much more aggressive in terms of what defines the canon than they used to be. And if you compare shows, 
you'll see the difference. So, I mean, the show about primitivism at MoMA was an amazing sign of the old fashioned colonialist approach. And no curator today would dare to do a show like that on moral grounds. And that's a big step forward. So that takes care of the institutions and the institutional critique mm -hmm. and the educational term and all those terms. But today, I think the fight is different. Mm -hmm. Today, the fight is not anymore that, it's STEM. It's a new culture that is developed. It's not a new culture, but it's a culture that is reaching to an extreme in which the humanities are being taken out. Art is being either monetized or taken out. The, the speculation about impossibility is slowly being censored, not explicitly, but in terms of everyday life. And we're starting to think just in terms of practicality and of financial benefits and not of speculation about things that may improve society, actually. That's wonderful. There's an ecology of knowledge that is yep. being destroyed. Yeah, no, that's very poignant. Um, I see Peggy, Peggy has her hand raised. Peggy, would you, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Um, I don't know how this works. Can can you talk? Would you like to talk, Peggy? <laughs> or you're muted if you are not trying to talk. Um, well, not, okay. Maybe that she accidentally pressed. Um, okay, um, Peggy, if you have a question, feel free to um, type it in the Q&A, but I'm gonna go through our other lists of questions um, here. Um, we have this question from uh, Frank Goodyear who asks um, that the books that constitute the piece, this is a poetic statement, have already started to age. The pages have yellow, the spines are cracked, the creases are evident. How should, if the museum should care for this work, how should we care for it now and in the future, in your opinion? Well, that's a nice critical view of the museum. I mean, you're stuck. The museum is fetishist, therefore it will carefully measure the position of the books and all those elements and try to conserve or restore exactly how it is. If you ask me, I really don't care. All books eventually will look yellowish, cracked and old. The position is irrelevant. The color of the tape is irrelevant. It's about the relation of a pile of books taped the way it is at random and the title and what it produces in you as a viewer. What does it trigger? So all those pieces, all those assignments are open. None has the right answer. And they're all supposed to trigger and put you in a mode of generating your own conclusions, your own ideas, and hopefully, your own assignments, which would be the ultimate. But the ultimate goal is that I become irrelevant and unnecessary and that I don't have to do art anymore. That day I will succeed. <laughs> so the, I think Frank, the answer is that it's up to us to decide what to do going forward. Um, I mean, I, I'm assuming that, you know, if the, the assignment was to generate our own assignment that we can take with the books what we will. And then the problem is for the future generation of museum curators to decide what their next assignment will be. Some years ago, MoMA had a show, was a drawing show called Online. And I had a piece which initially was like 120 feet long but then it was reduced for time constraints. It was called two parallel lines. And one line was linear garbage, like strings and cables and branches and things I would find on the street or in a basement or whatever. The other line would be titles that were so sort of pseudo clever 
<laughs> but that would give meaning to whatever piece was above it. So there was one line of objects and one line of text. So they called me from MoMA to set up 10 feet to make a photograph for the catalog. So I came with my bag of garbage and at random took pieces, put them on the wall with pins and then wrote my title. Then they took the picture and then an assistant curator came with gloves and took down each piece of the objects and wrapped them in glassine paper. And so I said, what are you doing? I mean, I was about to put them back in my garbage bag. <laughs> said, well, no, we're going to archive them for when you do the installation. I said, but it's garbage. And she said, no, it's not, it's art. Okay, and that tells you the dilemma. Mm. And I sometimes go to the, my gallery and not anymore, but I did at the beginning. And, and for the receptionist, I would take a piece of paper and rub it with my hands. And say, okay, now you have a work of art. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> So it's a very superstitious profession you have there, in which you assign value that is totally imponderable and imperceptible and intangible, but mm. it's still there. It's very odd. I mean, it's, it's like magic in the word sense of the word. Yeah. Speaking of the gallery, we do have two questions about your show at Alexander Gray Associates, which we briefly discussed that had to do with pairing text from the old um, dictionary, the Webster dictionary with the Google map entries. Um, and Ivy had two questions about that, that show. Um, and her first question was about the decision to pause at the word cosmolite um, and to what extent are people supposed to read into it? Or do you think there is an overemphasis on the stopping point that takes away from the message of the show? And the sort of follow-up question to that is um, how you felt during the fragmentary, thoughtless knitting-like process in creating that installation. Was it therapeutic or stimulating or boring um, in, in sort of the process of making that installation? Okay, the, the first, uh, it's a work in progress. It ended at page 677 of my version, which was 420 of the original dictionary, because I had to deliver because the show was going to happen. So it could have ended somewhere else. So that it ended as the word cosmopolite was accidental, mm. and not so, because if I would have made a page more, which I did since, I did about 20 pages more since then. Uh, maybe the ending word would be less evocative. And uh, Brian, the curator in the gallery, liked the word cosmopolite as an ending. But it's not an ending, it's an interruption. And uh, I continue. I mean, I don't know I ever show it, but I'll continue. That's one. Second, the piece was a COVID piece. It was a piece in which after hectic traveling, I, I mean, the year before I was home, maybe two weeks at a time, I was traveling intensely and suddenly everything became Zoom, <laughs> and, like now. And uh, this was a way of traveling somehow. I always would start on Google map at home and then try to see where is the nearest location, which some sometimes was in China or in Norway or whatever, which was very interesting. It was interesting also because some sophisticated English words would not have a location in the United States, but mm -hmm. in some remote place. Yep. Which was nice, nice to see. So it was a way of virtual traveling for me, 
which made up for the frustration of new home. Otherwise, it was therapy like knitting. And mm. I always equated with knitting. And it was therapeutic and killing the boredom of writing a heady essay about education, which was equally boring. <laughs> well, it sounds like it truly is a fascinating process and you've inspired me to even take a stab at kind of looking into how words map onto um, to Google Maps. Um, I mean, Brian, Brian is here with us um, in the audience and I think Brian and I were talking about how there's also an element of autobiography in the sense that even though it's randomized, the locations that show up are probably in New York and the, the algorithm is reading into kind of your search pattern. So even though you're getting whatever is the top hit, um, that result is still semi-curated by the internet. So take that how you will with a grain of salt. But but I would not give importance to the biography part or autobiography part, but it's of no interest to me. Uh, it was one way of organizing it. And I didn't want to look for the funniest location or yeah. it, that would be too arbitrary. I want a system in this. Mm. And the most logical system was to always start where I was located. It wasn't about me. It was about creating some system that I myself couldn't challenge. Well, um, I realize we are a couple minutes after time, but I just want to answer this one last question before we say goodnight. Um, it's always hard to wrap up a conversation with Lewis because I feel like we can just talk for hours on end. But um, Anne Goodyear did have a question about um, your artistic influences and other artists that might have been influential to you. I think Anne in particular is thinking about Marcel Duchamp, but I wonder if you want to just quickly touch on other artistic influences in your practice. I think it, it depends when. When I was 14, I did like Michelangelo, <laughs> but I didn't know what art was about. And uh, I, yeah, Duchamp is important. I think uh, for me, for me, artists are, they design a game or they play a game. Sometimes they do both. But Duchamp was a designer of games and would play each game once. So for me, he is a super creator. While Rembrandt would play a game that was created by somebody else, but he played it so masterfully and so complexly mm. that I also like him, although he didn't influence me. Uh, I think I am close to Magritte. Not so much the paintings themselves, but the system mm -hmm. of combination, systems of order. And I sometimes feel I'm just translating stuff from this work into mine. I liked a lot Piranesi. I still like him. Uh, I like Grunewald. I mean, now we're going more into liking than into influence. So influence, I, I would say Marguerite Duchamp may be on the top. Wonderful. All right. On that aspirational, inspirational note, um, I want to thank you, Lewis, again for this conversation for the many conversations we've had. It's been um, so fun to speak with you and to hear your insights and to meet your plumber. Um, <laughs> um, I, I hope this will be not our last conversation and I want to thank you for being part of our show. I want to thank our audience for tuning in and for staying with us. Um, if you are in Maine, please come see the show. The show is on view here at Bowdoin through June 4th, um, 2023. And um, thank you again. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Lewis. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye, everyone.